So you've made it to Module 4. Congratulations! We're almost halfway through with this material already. Hopefully you're getting a better feel of some of the complexities involved in medical microbiology, but there will be plenty more to come in the other micro and non-micro courses as well. In this module, we'll start to increase the difficulty of material within the course. Though there will be a lot of new material to cover, your foundational knowledge should be a little more solidified by now. This module will be the first of several to cover the diverse gram-negative bacilli categories. The first three in the video tier will be the enteric curved rods, Heliobacter, Campylobacter, and Vibrio. Following these will be the three respiratory rods, Legionella, Haemophilus, and Bordetella. Lastly, Pseudomonas has also been grouped as here as well out of necessity. It can be placed in many different categories, but doesn't really fit neatly into any one in particular. So for convenience, it's been placed here as well. The first disease section here is covering Campylobacter. As one of these enteric bugs, it shouldn't be surprised that it will cause GI distress. Many of the enteric microbes are broadly categorized as either causing bloody or watery diarrhea. This one falls under the former. It can also cause the unusual presentation of reactive arthritis. This is sometimes caused by bowel-dwelling bacteria due to a not very well understood inflammatory process. Guillain-Barre is also an unusual manifestation associated with this bacteria. It's an autoimmune reaction that causes paralysis beginning at the feet and slowly working its way up the body. Usually this is self-limiting or may be treated for moderate symptoms. However, in severe disease, it can cause paralysis of the lungs and require hospitalization. H. pylori gained a lot of recognition in past decades for its association with stomach ulcers. Finding this pathogen in the stomach of many patients with ulcers led to the conclusion that it was playing a pivotal role in the creation of these ulcers. It has also been linked to increases in Barrett's esophagus due to stomach acidity and reflux. Just like normal acid reflux, the changing environments can lead to a metaplastic change of the esophageal endothelium. Also due to the increased acidity, a maltoma might occur. When stomach lining cells are placed under constant barrage from the hostile acidic environment, they become inflamed and attempt to change to suit the environment. This can be a dysplastic or a metaplastic change. It makes sense that H. pylori would cause stomach ulcers, but don't forget that this acid is also dispelled into the intestines. As the duodenum is the first line of defense, it may also suffer from ulcerated changes. Although barrettes, ulcers, and maltomas are bad, they are often fairly indolent on their own, but any cell under constant inflammatory assault has the increased chances of neoplastic changes. For the Vibrio genus, the most important one to focus on is V. cholera. Of course, you have probably heard of cholera. Though uncommon in industrialized nations, it is still a leading cause of diarrheal disease and death in developing nations. It mostly causes severe, watery diarrhea that can lead to lethal dehydration. Imagine your worst case of watery gastritis and multiply it by 100. That's about how powerful a laxative V. cholera can be. We can also briefly mention Parahumolyticus and Vulnificus species. They are much more rare for exams and in reality. The main points to note is that Parahumolyticus is associated with fish and shellfish. You could possibly run into this on a cruise ship, for instance. Vulnificus causes Fisher's cellulitis and may be seen in oyster farmers. For our first respiratory rod, we have Legionella. In particular, the Pneumophilia species is of medical relevance and can cause diseases related to the airway. Less intuitive is the secretory diarrhea that the pathogen can cause. Much more popular and more testable is Legionnaire's disease. This disease got its name from the historic Pennsylvania American Legion Convention in the 70s, in which many of the attendees became sick with a mysterious illness. It likes to live in water reservoirs, such as the air conditioning system, which is where it seemed to be harbored during this convention. The two less common sequelae of legionellosis are Pontiac fever and heart block. Pontiac fever is a flu-like respiratory infection. It is a mild infection that usually doesn't require any treatment. Now on to pertussis. Pertussis is another that most households are familiar with. Luckily, they know the name due to their childhood vaccinations and not from someone actually having the disease. As this microbe is only found in humans, having adequate societal vaccination rates effectively eliminates the chances of coming down with pertussis. The nickname whooping cough was given to the characteristic pertussis cough due to the sound made by infected individuals. 
The cough can be so intense that a person is unable to breathe and even induce vomiting. For the last respiratory bacillus in this section, we have Hib. Haemophilus influenza serotype B is especially common in the pediatric population. As with many respiratory infections, it is quite contagious. Students often mix up this microbe with the influenza virus due to its name. Actually, scientists were also confused by the two pathogens for many years, leading to the naming that now leads to our confusion. Although there are also non-encapsulated species of Haemophilus, Hib is specifically important for its encapsulated properties. Hib causes a wide range of disease states and symptoms, but the highest yield by far is epiglottitis. This throat swelling can be so severe that it blocks the airway and can be lethal. The other Haemophilus species of note is not a respiratory pathogen, but a genital one. H. ducreae causes genital lesions called chancroids. These can visibly resemble the chancre seen in syphilis, with one major difference. These lesions are quite painful. And to finish off this module, let's briefly discuss the one bacteria that doesn't really fit well into any section, Pseudomonas. P. arginosa also possesses a wide array of both benign and fatal disease states. It can cause UTIs, skin infections, and infections of the hair follicles, which are usually a simple nuisance and easily treated. It can also lead to more concerning respiratory and heart pathogenesis, potentially leading to fatal outcomes. Typically, the only serious infections from Pseudomonas come from the hospitals and those that are immunocompromised. It is a common concern for post-surgical infections and burn victims. Okay, now we're getting back into the rhythm after a shorter previous module. Obviously, we've only scratched the surface of many of these microbes. Make sure to complete the in-course assignments and recommended resources for a more thorough understanding of each. In the next tier, we'll go over some of the more common signs and symptoms patients may present with for each of these disease states.